Hello everyone and welcome to The Vortex, where lies and falsehoods are trapped and exposed. I'm Michael Voris with a follow-up Vortex to an episode we did at the beginning of the week which generated over 1,200 comments. A familiar story is known in Rome and elsewhere of a moment when a member of the clergy was appealing to Pope Benedict to fix some horrible situation in the church, to use his authority to correct it. According to reports, Pope Benedict answered him by pointing at the threshold of the doorway in his study and saying, My authority stops there. Consider that stunning statement for a moment, an admission that the reach of his power was curtailed and to a huge extent. Of course, there's no way to prove these accounts or to confirm them, but they are revealing because they have the ring of truth to them. When Pope Benedict still held the office, we used to get hundreds, perhaps thousands of emails, letters, phone calls, saying in summary, why doesn't Pope Benedict do something about this or that, meaning a bad situation. In those cases, we never raised those questions in public, at least directly, out of deference for the Pope and his spiritual paternity. We definitely talked about the issues, but we did not lay them directly at the feet of the Pope. Partly, again, because of his office and also because we were then and are now aware that much of what a Pope does or says simply gets ignored by disobedient bishops. In short, in many ways, it does not matter what directive a Pope gives because on a local level, it can simply be ignored. This has been the case in the Church for decades now, most spotlighted in the example of Blessed Pope Paul VI and his issuing of Humanae Vitae, absolute disregard, and actual open rebellion. It's a sad reality, but it's true. Pope St. John Paul had to deal with this as well, and as of course, Pope Benedict. But for whatever reason, there has been in the church these past 50 years an absolute unwillingness to punish dissent among clerics and theologians. The rationale is the popes have been fearful of causing a schism. But what many, many people say in response is, well, there already is a schism in practical terms, something difficult to argue against. Which is why what Pope Benedict did in resigning his office has helped to create a situation that may take decades or even centuries to overcome. What it did was bring about a rupture in the papacy. Catholics have always understood and accepted the tradition, the small t, but very important small t, tradition, that a pope is pope for life. You could count on it, take it to the bank. Consider for a moment the feelings that raced through you when you first heard the news, the that can't be right sensation. You remember exactly where you were when you heard that news. It was so stunning to you. In a world ruled by doubt and constant change and insecurity, such an unparalleled action adds to that instability in the minds of many people. He did something no other pope in history has done under these circumstances. He simply resigned. There are only three other examples in all of history. Two of them were forced into resignation, one of them to bring about the end of the Western Schism, and Pope Celestine resigned in 1294 after only having been Pope for five months. So even among the very rarefied air of Popes who have resigned, Pope Benedict's actions must be viewed as singular and exceptional. What this resignation has done is set in motion Forever from this point on, a ruptured, changed, altered view of the papacy in the minds of the faithful. Pope Francis himself has said publicly that he might resign. And there are rumors all over Rome from various sources we have in the Vatican that this might actually happen. The papacy has a dignity around it, an air of the sacred, which it should have, in the minds of people, which makes it a sacrosanct institution, which of course it is. That air does not belong to the man in the office, but to the office itself. To give the impression that it can be viewed as corporate officers handling the position of CEO and then to have that idea start to cement in people's minds damages the church. It removes the impression, although of course not the truth, of its divine character. The point must now be taken into consideration that the precedent having been set that a good cardinal, having been elected to the papacy, could now somehow be blackmailed into resigning. Prior to Benedict's actions, that would never have been in play. If a group of sinister-minded cardinals were to approach a pope and say, resign or we will reveal X, Y, Z, they'd be extremely unlikely to do that because the pope could answer back, I can't, popes don't resign. And knowing that in advance that he would be right and it would never have been done, 
That would be a nearly impossible notion in the minds of these sinister cardinals. Well, not anymore. And it raises the specter in people's minds now that perhaps this is exactly what happened. People rightfully are wondering, and not so quietly, why did he do that? Why did he resign? And then the question comes up, was he blackmailed? Remember that 300-page dossier that was given to him a few months before he retired, allegedly de detailing massive homosexuality within the Vatican and the Roman clergy? It came out of the Vatileak scandal. No one has ever heard another word about that dossier. The resignation has damaged the church. It has created a rupture with the past. Another weapon has been placed into the hands of sinister men which they might not otherwise have ever had. It has reduced the church in the minds of many weak-minded or weak-faith people to a great big fancy corporation that's been around for a very long time. It has fueled stories that some nefarious actions or scandals were used to blackmail him. And worth noting, this came right on the heels, the resignation, right on the heels of the non-stop news about the sex abuse crisis, causing some people to think and journalists to actually write that he, the Pope himself, was somehow compromised in that whole sordid mess, and that was what was behind the resignation. We don't believe he was, but that's not the point. The point is that among many people, this now becomes a viable conversation and has been going on for all these years. And that last, that list of damage is only on one level, in the psyches of people all over the world. The actual on-the-ground reality that this has brought about is everything that has happened in Rome for the past year and some, which has even further destabilized the idea of the church in people's minds. Most people do not have the time or the inclination or the intelligence or the education or whatever to grasp or explore beyond the surface of current events. But they approach these events with various preconceived notions. In the case of the church, the overwhelming notion in the average guy's mind is the church is changeless. Stability, rock sure, stature about everything about the faith. That is made visible in the unchangingness of many aspects of her day-to-day -day life. Now obviously, this was the great crisis following Vatican II. That which could never be viewed as changeable suddenly was. When that happens, the thought quite naturally arises in people's minds that the teachings of the church can now change, that they're mutable as well. And that point is what has been driven home here by many of these wicked men. Benedict's leaving of office has engendered a whole host of problems, sure, likely unforeseen and unintended, and given them impetus. One argument put forth at the Synod by a heterodox bishop picked up this very theme. He said, we're in different times. Lots of things have changed now, so perhaps we need to look at some of the ways the church understands some of these things today. That argument, as a journalist noted, as well as the most respected historian in Italy that we were talking, all, talking with this all about, is greatly helped along by what Pope Benedict did. This approach, that things change, is now the recurring theme we hear all over Rome. Priests are depressed, bishops unsure of themselves, many good men in the hierarchy are rattled. The resignation has fueled that engine. We must be honest enough to look at that and say, yes, he made a mistake. Because to leave that unaddressed, the resignation and the problems from it, continues to leave it hanging out there as part of a larger narrative that can only be used for bad. Mistakes must be called out and recognized even when it's distasteful to say so. They must not be allowed to go unexposed and untreated so they can be used later as a rationale to make even larger mistakes, many of which are intended. The ramifications of this will last for a very, very long time and more than likely in ways that we have not yet even imagined. We have no animosity toward Pope Benedict or the things he's evil or anything of the kind. We quote him left and right all the time. But this has caused an earthquake in the church, and that must be admitted. And if we are to recover from the serious decline the church is in, we must look at everything that has contributed to it. First of all, most importantly, our own sins. Second of all, our own dispositions to give some people a free pass. Third, the unwillingness to confront serious issues because of the controversy surrounding them. We are in uncharted waters, my fellow Catholics, and we have to recognize that reality in every dimension. God love you. I'm Michael Voris.